Papers Disc 5 350 years passed with little more kerfluffle than the occasional irate cat owner. Then something happened that changed the course of troll human history forever. In 1967, the London Bridge, which ran across the River Thames and was the busiest hub of traffic in that great city, was disassembled and shipped in its entirety over 5,000 miles away to Lake Havasu City, Arizona. Absurd though this may seem, it is true. A rich engineer purchased the London Bridge as a tourist attraction to bring people to his out-of-the-way real estate development. The Arizona reconstruction took over three years to complete, but it took only an hour for the trolls who'd stowed away inside the bridge segments to escape. Upon landing in Arizona, the inhabitants of London Bridge tore apart their crates and fled into the night. By January of 1968, they had crossed the California border and set about doing what old world trolls did best, eating children. This treacherous tribe, made up of all the worst elements of every troll family in Europe, was collectively known as the Gum Gums. Gum Gums? Tub repeated. That's probably the least scary name I've ever heard. Imagine what we think of Dershowitz, Blinky replied. This comment I didn't bother to translate. The Gum Gums had terrorized the Eurasian continent for well over a thousand years. They were first mentioned in a parchment addressed to King Constantine II, circa 920 A.D., wherein they were described as horrid and of putrid breath and hoggish in their appetites. In the 1100s, the Gum Gums descended from the Scottish Highlands, and just one hundred years later were known to have taken possession of every single bridge in Londinium under the barbaric command of their ageless leader, Gunmar the Black. It is believed that Gunmar chose to center his clan in San Bernardino specifically to spite the self-satisfied pacifists who populated the local underworld. Whatever the reason, he and his minions wasted no time stealing children. One per month for the first three months, then one per week. By the time 1969 began, several children were disappearing every week in San Bernardino, each one of them dragged screaming to a hidden underground labyrinth and caged for weeks before being grilled over an open flame and eaten. American trolls had lost their instinct for fighting and allowed the Gum Gum Blitz to continue for far too long. At last, the American tribes gathered for a wapentake, an ancient Viking tradition whereupon the leaders of each clan, from the Bluzbumps to the Kiltillians, turned over their weapons so that they might speak toward a common goal. Together, they admitted the consequences of not getting involved, a new war between trolls and humans on the continent they'd worked so hard to keep neutral. Fortunately, they had strong numbers and a stronger leader. At the tender age of seventy-five, she was yet a child, but already possessed of a strong will, an optimistic outlook, and an aptitude for adventure. Her name was Johanna M. Arg. What's the M stand for? I asked. Mmm, Blinky replied. Johanna M. Arg would lead an army of trolls on a hunt for the gum gum lair. With great pomp and fanfare, they dug up chests containing some of the most prized possessions in all trolldom ancient astrolabes that, according to lore, had been gifted by the fairy folk of Lower Scandinavia after a tribe of snick-snuck trolls rescued a coterie of fairies from torture at the hooves of a deranged fawn. Guided by these mystical compasses, the trolls began searching for the gum-gums. At the same time, an up-and-coming scribe and record-keeper of the Lizgump clan, who went by the name of Blinky, was tasked with the study of genealogical scrolls in hopes of locating a human paladin who could aid them in their oncoming battle. 
Day and night, Blinky scoured eight scrolls at once, devoting one eye per scroll, until the strain was so great that, one by one, the eyes went blind, but not before discovering a family of Sturgises right there in San Bernardino. Sorry you lost your eyesight, I said. Indeed, it was a happenstance most disagreeable, Blinky replied, seeing how I was but a lad of forty-four and four hundred years. I, of course, devote a full volume of my dissertation to this tragedy. The drafting of a paladin was considered a great risk. Living in peace beneath humans was one thing, but fighting alongside one? It had never been done. But with the milk carton epidemic in full swing, it was a necessary gamble. So it was that on September 21st, 1969, Jack Sturgis was taken against his will into Troll City, where he rapidly matured into a prominent warrior. With Jack working in tandem with Arg, the Troll army ransacked the Gum Gum Lair, while Jack single-handedly dispatched dozens of lesser trolls and commanded his legion of warriors with unflagging vigor, it was Johanna Arg who took on the Hungry One. It was a battle long in the making. Eleven hundred years earlier, Gunmar had lost an arm to Ramara Arg, Johanna's grandmother, in a fantastic midnight skirmish along the Austria-Hungary border. Since that night, Gunmar had not only sworn his revenge, but had also begun to notch each kill on the makeshift wooden arm he'd rammed into his still-bleeding stump. The first wave of the onslaught was bleak. Gunmar, a beast so indescribably awful that he cannot at this particular moment be described, toyed with Johanna Arg. It was only when Gunmar embedded a boulder in the hairy troll's cranium that the tide began to change. Instead of killing Johanna Arg, the injury seemed to squash whatever small amount of hesitation existed in her brain. She became an uncontrollable, rampaging beast who came at Gunmar in a tornado of teeth, claws, and fur. One of Gunmar's eyes, the Eye of Malevolence, was torn out in the fray. Soon Gunmar fell, his minions were killed or captured, and it was left to Jack, the human hero, to deliver the killing blow to the Hungry One. Exhausted of bloodshed, Jack instead banished Gunmar into isolation among the deepest of Earth's caves. Gunmar slunk away, swearing revenge upon Jack, Johanna, Arg and all of their offspring. These curses were difficult to understand, for Gunmar was chewing upon his tongue in rage. Every sound he released hissed like a serpent. <sniffs> Jack's mercy was a success in one sense. The remaining gum-gums swore to switch to a four-legged diet and enlisted in several eleven-step programs to keep them on the non-human eating wagon. Festivity reigned in the Troll Kingdom for months. As a sign of respect, trolls began referring to Johanna by her last name alone, and parent trolls would hold up their babies when ARG passed by, so that the young ones could touch the boulder still sticking out of the back of her skull. That chunk of bedrock remains there to this day, Blinky said. It is the reason for my friend's impaired speech. Arg agreed. Rock make unhappy talk. What Jack realized too late was that he'd doomed himself to a subterrestrial life. His mercy had been a distinctly human thing. No troll would have hesitated to destroy Gunmar and so he felt a responsibility to keep watch should Gunmar ever return. If Jack returned to the human world, he would grow older, and eventually the doorways to the troll world would be lost to him. He would need to stay young to defend against Gunmar, and the only way to do that was to remain underground.
Jack, forever thirteen, trained every day, every year, ever watchful, ever paranoid. He was the only one not surprised several months before when the eye of malevolence showed them Gunmar's slow trek back from the bowels of the earth. Jack had made speeches in Troll City, but nobody listened. The trolls there had become fat, complacent, consumed with their food and trinkets, and certain that nothing like the Gum Gum War could happen again. So defensive efforts were up to Jack, Blinky, and Arg. As Gunmar's power grew, Jack decided with great regret that Jim would have to be tested for paladin potential. But Jack had figured on having months, even years, to properly train his nephew. Now, with the news of a bridge being reconstructed in the San Bernardino Historical Society Museum, those months and years had been shaved down to mere days. The Killaheed Bridge had been the ancestral home of Gunmar the Black in the far northern region of Scotland, known in Gaelic as a Gaeltach. It is where he murdered every blood relative, erasing his surname in favor of the Black, and began the Gum Gum cult with himself as the principal deity. The bridge was the nexus of his ancient power, and its shipment from across the ocean toward California must be what was powering his quick regeneration and drawing weak-minded trolls, a new army of Gum Gums, back under his influence. For months, trolls had been infiltrating San Bernardino at night and creating havoc. Nothing so far as abduction, not yet, but Jack, Blinky, and Arg had been kept busy enough that they'd had little chance to search out Gunmar himself. It had been a gamble revealing themselves to Jim and, inadvertently, Tub. But in war, such wagers were necessary. This was the lot of the Troll Hunters. Troll Hunters. I couldn't help smiling a little. I liked the sound of it. Chapter 21 Jack waited for us in an unlit clearing with the burlap sack over his shoulder. The clay wall before him was cracked to reveal patches of intricate tile mosaics and begrimed frescoes created by troll artists of yesteryear. Entering this clearing from the tunnel was like traveling from throat to stomach. The rumble of motor vehicles, somewhere far above us, completed the illusion. He seemed smaller inside that scrap metal armor than he had before more the dimensions of an adolescent boy than an inscrutable devil. Surely he had heard our approach, yet he did not react. I was about to say something when I noticed a group of trolls off to the right. Tub and I skittered aside, but Blinky and Arg showed no alarm. In fact, in their strange faces, I saw pity. It was the same routine I'd seen in the red light district, these trolls stood in a trance before a leaning tower of flickering half-busted TVs, their faces pressed to the sets, their long tongues lapping at the screens. Do not stare, Blinky said. It is a lamentable sight. What's with you guys and TVs? I asked. Blinky spoke in a hush. Do not be quick to judge, small-brained one. There is no sun in the life of a troll, indeed, scarce little light at all. Is it any wonder that we cherish your televisions, that some of us even worship them like primitive man worshipped his sun gods, Ra, Helios, Apollo, Sol Invictus, Huitzilopochtli? His tentacles rippled haughtily. There is not a troll alive who possesses fewer than two sets. What shows do you guys like? What you would consider lacking in entertainment value, we prefer. Commercials, in fact, are prized among us for their accelerated pace and bright colorings. Nothing, though, satisfies like pure static. 
Should you find time to study this liquid weave, you will discover beauty, divinity. So many sifting layers, so many patterns of meaning, so many whispered secrets. Drool poured from the slack mouths of at least two of the mesmerized trolls. So it's like a drug? I asked. It is precisely a drug. The calming effect is unlike anything else, and it is perfectly healthy in moderation. Today's troll experiences almost daily televisual contact. Nurses use them to ease the dementia of the elderly. Mothers use them to quiet their brood. I myself once spent a period of years riveted by an extraordinary signal from a faraway place called the BBC. I like to think that it contributed to the melodious harmonics of my voice. It did, I said. Trust me. But I am one of the fortunate. Like any drug taken in excess, it can ruin a mind. Those poor souls there will give every coin they have to try new signals, better signals, any signal at all, and while doing so will forget to eat, forget to drink, forget to excrete their waste. It is no coincidence that many cemeteries are located near static dens. Why doesn't it affect people that way? Doesn't it, dear boy? All right, I see what you're saying, but why? Jack slapped the brick with his right hand and snarled without turning around. You ask too many questions. Why this? Why that? How does it all work? What does it all mean? Down here, things are what they are. You better get used to it. Or better yet, stop caring. Because there will never be enough answers to satisfy you, and even if there were, we don't have the time. From within his suit of metal, he withdrew yet more metal, the intersecting disks and dials of an astrolabe. I knew from school that astrolabes were used in the Middle Ages to identify stars, but none that I'd seen in textbooks measured up to this clockwork contraption. It was no larger than a teacup saucer, but intricate beyond imagination. At least four rings, each pitted within the other, rolled about on sharp bronze teeth, while two hands notched with indecipherable measurements struck collision points. The whole thing was encased in a lattice of gold and decorated around the circumference with a forest silhouette so detailed that I could make out the etchings of individual leaves. Craftsmanship notwithstanding, the gold was burnished, the bronze stained, the various components bent and chipped. Jack held the weathered astrolabe in the air, spun the wheels, and swept it across an increasingly small stretch of wall until he was able to touch one single brick with a finger. This was Arg's signal. She shouldered her way closer, footfalls disrupting the TV signals. Several trolls broke from their trances and threw us spiteful looks. Arg! placed both paws to the wall. The muscled carpet of her back rippled, and the wall opened along the irregular pattern of the brick. I covered my face against the specks of stone sent swirling by the churning cloud of dust. Tub and I shooed away the grit and watched as Jack and the two trolls made their way into a place that looked oddly familiar. We, too, passed through the door and were so amazed by what we saw that we weren't startled by the sound of the wall sealing shut behind us. A road sign. That's what we were looking at. Not in troll language, not featuring some multi-headed beast, just a regular yellow road sign warning truck drivers that the bridge had a low clearance. Yes, that's right. We were under a bridge. More specifically, a highway underpass in a darkened industrial corridor in what looked like an anonymous suburb. We looked around and found worthless craft that now was the most welcome sight in the whole world. Obscene graffiti on the concrete, 
six-pack rings collecting against a chain-link fence, and the red and yellow lights of a fast food joint just over the next rise in the road. There were street signs, too, and Tubb was excitedly pointing them out. De La Rosa! We're in De La Rosa! We could walk home from here! He addressed Jack. Is it cool if we walk home from here? Jack was still consulting his astrolabe. Cars crossed overhead, oblivious of the creatures that lurked below. After an interminable silence, he snapped shut the golden device and pointed. Null haulers, two blocks away. They're converging. We need to make this quick. He threw down the sack. I flinched at the violent clashing noise. Jack jabbed his chin at it. Go ahead. Accepting the bag's contents seemed like it would solidify my position in this bizarre brigade. I hesitated. The thirteen-year-old unsheathed the sword and drove it into the pavement. Alarmed ants scrambled out of the fresh fissure. Jack's voice crackled from the boombox speaker. Gunmar the Black gets stronger every day. More and more trolls, dangerous ones, are disappearing because they're drawn to do his bidding. Every night, minions like these null haulers stray farther. They're in De La Rosa tonight. You want them to be at your house tomorrow? You want kids on your block to start disappearing? You want to know what that's like? Tub made an impatient gesture at the bag. I took a breath, leaned over, and opened it. Inside were two weapons, a dull, pockmarked longsword and a short, curved cutlass. I held them in either hand, so thrown off by the uneven weight that I wondered if I'd be able to take two steps without pitching over. What about me? I don't get any weapons? Tub asked. No, Jack replied. You want to walk home? Walk. Tubbs' shoulders slumped. He looked hurt. If Jack cared, you couldn't tell through that mask. He pulled his sword from the cement and swirled it through the air with such speed that it seemed to become liquid mercury. It caught the yellow streetlights and drew upon the nighttime canvas like holiday sparklers. Three rules. Jack said. Rule number one, be afraid. No problem, Tubbs said. We're going to nail that one. Being afraid means being aware. Think of the rabbit. The sword drew a simple sketch of a rabbit. It was so graceful and unexpected that I gasped. Then it was gone so quickly that I was left wondering if I had imagined it. The rabbit is nothing but vulnerable parts and good meat, throat, belly, thigh, yet it is hard to catch. It watches and listens all of the time because it is afraid. Trolls smell fear and charge it. You can use this to your advantage. Again the sword swirled through the sky. This time the golden outline of a bull burned into my retinas long after it had dissipated from the air. Just like a Toreador in a bullfight. Use their weight or velocity or anger against them. When you do strike, do it hard and do it fast. Jack squiggled the blade across the sky and I saw an elegant sketch of a python with a forked tongue and a long tail. I tried to follow the tail to its end, but I blinked, and the delicate artwork was lost. Imagine you're injecting poison. Attack and retract. Attack and retract. Rabbit. Bull. Python. My imagination assembled a mythological beast with parts of all three. How this amalgamated monster related to my own theoretical fighting tactics should have been entirely unclear, and yet it wasn't. A strange clarity swept over me regarding how these three animals 
made the perfectly lethal mix. Jack swung the sword like a golf club, shooting two stones, one that hit my knee, breaking me from my fantasies, and one that struck Tub in the stomach. I hopped up and down in pain, and Tub grunted, clutching his tummy. He had our attention, all right. Rule number two. There are three vulnerable spots on a troll. Jack pointed his weapon at Arg, and she shuffled over and leaned down, an eager model. Jack swung his sword at her body. I held my breath as the sword halted just short of her chest fur. Arg! wiggled like it tickled. The heart, Jack said. He spun around, weaving reflected light around him so that he was ribboned in temporary golden lace. The tip of the sword swooped toward Arg's lower belly. The gallbladder. The sword cut downward, and Jack hopped over it as easily as skipping rope. It passed behind his back from one hand to the other before Jack extended his limbs and the tip of the blade rested at the side of Arg's neck. There, I noticed, a small growth bulged beneath the fur. The softies. Arg yawned, a ghastly sight. Softies, Tub repeated. I must have missed that day in biology. What's a softie? Jack whirled around. Yellow light burned off his lenses. It's a part that kills trolls when you stick it, he snapped. This is what we'll be doing this week. All we'll be doing this week. If you're right about the Killaheed, we have seven nights counting tonight before the bridge reaches completion. We have to eliminate the Gum Gum minions before then and be ready to take on Gunmar. Heart, softies, that's how you kill a troll. The gallbladder, that's how you make sure he stays dead. That fire in our cave, that's where we burn them. Collect and burn, got it? A gallbladder left behind can sprout the troll back to life like a seed. I felt nauseated. The frog dissection in seventh grade had been difficult enough. You know, this week's not so good, I said. It's the festival of the fallen leaves. Wouldn't surprise me if Dad needs help mowing some of the parks. And I'm in this play. We've only got this week to rehearse it. And math! There's a huge math test on Friday, too, and Miss Pinkton says if I don't get 88%, I'm going to flunk. So I've really got to study. You will study. With me. Out here. Every night. He swung his blade so that the tip rang across both of my own swords, causing them to twirl in my hands. I had to grip them more tightly so they wouldn't clatter to the pavement. I wondered if that had been the point. Name them. Quick. My palms were still stinging. Name what? Your swords. A troll hunter must name his sword before he draws first blood. I looked blankly at the long sword and cutlass. Now! Jack seethed. The null haulers are gathering. I... Something that's important to you. Just say it. Whatever comes out is the right answer. Claire, I blurted, holding up the long sword. Tub gave me a sidelong smirk. Claire, he repeated. I hoped that the darkness covered the flush of my cheeks. Claire, blade, Claire, blade. Tub covered his lap with his hand. Whatever, man. Quick, Jack urged. The cutlass. Uh, I stared at the sharp, pocked metal. The dull, stubborn surface revealed nothing. I turned to Tub. What was the name of that cat you had? That cat? We've had sixty or seventy. The cat! You know, the one that liked me. Oh, right. Cat number six. It would have to do. 
I held up the cutlass and flashed a desperate grin. Cat number six, I shouted. Jack stared at me. Even through his armor, I could feel the chill of his disappointment. Behind me, I could hear Tubbs' muffled snickers and the tut-tutting of Blinky. Even Arg's shoulders quaked in a manner that suggested laughter. I squeezed the handles of Claire Blade and Cat Number Six and glared at Uncle Jack. What are yours named? If you're so great at naming inanimate objects... Blinky and Arg went silent. Tub, too, sensed the change in mood and stifled his laughter. Even the vehicles on the bridge above seemed to sense the weight of the moment. There was no traffic for the longest time. Jack contemplated the longsword he held in his right hand. After a time, he reached back and withdrew a shorter blade. He held both with tenderness, as if they were not weapons, but monuments to the dead. He indicated the longsword. Victor Power. He raised the scimitar. Dr. X. All of us could feel in our guts the significance the words held for Jack. He rolled his shoulders to rouse his body from contemplation. His stance broadened and the bike chains wrapped around his legs crackled. He lifted both swords one high and one low, in a threatening attack formation. The die-cast trucks on his chest spun their wheels, and the notebook spirals around his biceps clicked like barbed wire. Pay attention, he said. This is going to be fast. He wasn't kidding. Over the next ten minutes, he swung, thrust, parried, fainted and jabbed with dazzling agility and coordination, Dr. X barely finishing one breathtaking stroke before Victor Power blurred by with the speed of the next. The lessons were furious. Attack formations, defense positions, footwork for advance and retreat, techniques for battling those taller than you as well as those far smaller. Jarring changes in tempo to bewilder your foe, the combination of both blades to redirect an onslaught, fighting one-on-one -on -one as well as taking on an entire group, the calculations of speed versus brute strength that determined a one-handed versus two-handed grip. Each technique, drawn from Renaissance and medieval schools of combat, had a name, and he barked them out. Boar's Tooth, Bata Secreta, Double Round, Durchführen, False Edge, Imbrocada, Kissing the Button, On the Pass, Scandialio, Bolte. Then he added a few techniques from the Jack Sturgis school. Showier moves with names more befitting a thirteen-year-old boy. The Drunken Chicken, Bloody Bloody Blah, The Blue Jean Surprise, Idiot gets a face full, and his magnum opus, Fling the Poop. Right away, it was clear that I was expected to memorize this menu of mayhem. The reason I can repeat them to you in alphabetical order is because I did. I didn't mean to. If I couldn't memorize the banal bits of information hurled at me by Miss Pinkton, and if I couldn't muster the minimal athletic ability demanded by Coach Lawrence, how was I expected to combine the two and do so under the duress of a swashbuckling back-from-the-dead uncle, two hideous trolls, and the promise of hunting down something called a null holler? Yet I felt the information file into never-before-used compartments of my brain, as if the cerebral space had been waiting all this time, absorbent and hungry for the right kind of facts to fill it. Arg! sniffed the air. Her orange eyes blazed, and she drove the points of her horns into the underside of the bridge. Crumbles of cement colored a patch of her hair gray. Jack understood and reached for the astrolabe. 
but R was already loping away from the bridge, nose lifted, drool hanging down in eight-foot strands. Jack made a hand motion to Blinky. Instantly, tentacles curled around my and Tubbs' shoulders. Courage can ebb when the moment of confrontation is nigh. But worry not, diminutive pixies. Fate would not allow a troll of my character to be struck down upon such an undistinguished field of battle. Not before my greatest wish is fulfilled. I speak, of course, of my unfinished historical dissertation. That wasn't enough to put me at ease. I pointed at Arg. What's her greatest wish? I asked. Better dental hygiene, Blinky answered, without hesitation. Arg, crooked, crud-covered teeth and all, was quickly leaving us behind. We exited the velvet darkness of the bridge and entered the menacing coolness of an autumn evening. Arg avoided streetlights by adopting a low four-legged trot and keeping beneath an overhang of trees alongside the road. I was the last to pass Jack, who was sheathing his swords, waiting to bring up the rear. His gloved hand shot out and nabbed my arm. Don't be nervous. His voice was a low rasp. You'll love it. It didn't sound like a promise, more like a curse. Chapter 22 Suburbia looked vulnerable to me now. The houses were built of flimsy walls instead of solid stone. The picket fences were laughable in their meager attempts at claiming a piece of land. The ornamental mailboxes and flower lattices cried out for indifferent destruction. Each identical row of houses looked like a line of eggs waiting to be stomped on. We rested on our elbows among the bushes in a backyard. Arg concealed herself in the opposite fashion, standing straight enough to be mistaken for another tree. Fifty feet away was a house painted a pale pink, and I strained for signs of trolls in the flower bed, the scatterings of garden tools, the swinging porch bench, the coils of water hose. There, Jack said. There, 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 there. It took me several minutes before I could see the null haulers. Concealed in shadow by scruffy gray coats, they were the size of monkeys and had noodly arms and legs unequal to the task of carting around their obese bodies. Their eyes were large and completely black and their noses dark and runny. Most notable were mouths so wide that the corners almost met at the back of the head. As they crawled, the top halves of their heads popped up and down like garbage can lids. Damn it, Jack whispered. There's number six. Why, is that one worse? I asked. Nullhullers, the odious cretins, Blinky replied. They travel in packs of five. Indeed, four more fat, long-limbed creatures wobbled onto the scene, and then there were ten giggling and snorting null haulers. Eight of them were gesturing at a second-floor window, though I could not imagine how creatures so fat would scale the wall. Meanwhile, the remaining two began scribbling across the side of the house with what looked like red chalk. They made a circle then within that circle drew an upside-down star. I recognized it as the sign of Satan cherished by all the heavy metal kids at school. Nullhullers are Satanists? I hissed. Don't be silly, Blinky scolded. They're Irish. More to the point, the Nullhullers are such a disorderly bunch that they are attracted to order wherever they can find it. Hence the traveling in fives, Hence the attraction to drawing symbols of perfect symmetry. It was only by accident that they discovered that this particular symbol struck fear into the hearts of suburban adults, 
who would blame attacks on humans with impure beliefs. An ingenious cover, I must admit. There was a nattering among the null holders indicating that they were ready to act. The ten of them drew together in a loose circle, quivering in excitement, their mouths lifting open to reveal sparse, square teeth that looked like chunks of granite. How lucky you are, Blinky said. You are about to witness possibly the most vile ritual in all of Trolldom. The Null Huller's squat bodies began to hitch and jiggle. Thick drool poured from their agape mouths, followed by a brown lard. A symphony of choking sounds emitted from their bodies as a plump, translucent sack began to emerge from each gaping throat. The sacks were nearly the size of a Null Huller itself and crammed with soft objects of different shapes and colors. They squirted out of the Null Huller's mouths and landed upon the grass with moist splats where they palpitated and shivered. We're spending Saturday night watching Trolls Bark, Tub said. Good times, Jim. Legendary times. The Null Hullers are nothing if not cunning, Blinky said with a measure of respect. Knowing that their weight prevents swift movement, they eject their organs for a short time, all but their hearts, making them among the most nimble of all trolls. Now as light and empty as pillowcases, the Null Hullers scrambled up the side of the house with the dexterity of squirrels. Beside me, Jack reached into the bramble of bike chains around his thighs and withdrew three corroded old horseshoes. He handed one to Blinky and one to Arg. I'll schmoof the parents, he said. If there are siblings, grandparents, anything like that, use the horseshoes. Horseshoes, I repeated, trying to keep up. Why horseshoes? Didn't we mention? Blinky asked. Ye gods, there is so much ground to cover. Null hullers are changelings. They are here to replace a human baby with one of their wretched own. It's an abominable practice. If left undetected, a troll changeling can grow to full adulthood under its human skin, terrorizing the world with ruinous behavior. A good deal of your world's top CEOs and politicians are null hullers, I'm sorry to say. Thus we must test the family members for trollhood. The quickest way is by pressing a horseshoe to the forehead. Iron works best, but in a pinch, anything of horseshoe design will suffice. Well, give me one, I cried. You're not coming in, Jack said. He shoved into my hands the burlap sack in which he had transported my swords. You cut open those organ sacks, throw the gallbladders in the bag, and stand guard if any of those things start coming out the windows. If they do, remember your lessons. Hold on, Tub cried. What the hell am I supposed to do? Jack pointed at the satanic stars. Wash those stupid symbols off the wall. Use that hose. He scanned our faces. Everybody ready? No! Tub and I cried in unison. Let's go! Jack shouted. Arg! Smacked her frothy lips and tore across the lawn. Jack ran at a full sprint at her side, the moonlight splashing across the metal edges of his armor. Blinky, too, raced along on his unknowable legs, though Tub and I were able to keep up with him. It was with unflagging dedication that I taught myself to move by touch and smell, Blinky narrated for our listening pleasure. Tonight, that is a mixed blessing. Seconds later, I knew what he meant. The organ sacks were rancid. Tub and I stopped short, gagging and coughing. Blinky continued without us, joining Jack at the back door he'd just jimmied open with Dr. X. 
Jack hurried inside the house, followed by Blinky. Arg was too large to fit inside, but mere physics didn't stop her. She popped both arms from their sockets and twisted her oversized simian body in startling ways, then, somehow, disappeared inside. Tub and I stared at the back door as it shut. The house was dark and quiet. We peered up at the second floor window, conjuring horrible fantasies of what might be happening just out of sight. At last, there was nothing else to look at. We dragged our eyes down to the ten rippling organ sacks. That's all you, Tub said. I'm on graffiti duty. Tub held his nose and headed for the hose. I forced myself to edge closer to the ten sacks. They throbbed upon the dark lawn like soft mutant embryos. I leaned over the nearest one. Purple lungs inflated against the translucent film. A slimy stomach surged against it like a red, blobby wave. Pooled near the bottom was a white heap of squirming intestines. All of it floated within a snotty glop. Slowly, I withdrew cat number six. I placed the tip of the cutlass against the sack and pushed gently. It pierced the skin with a flatulent sound and liquid the color of mustard sprayed across my arm. It reeked of spoiled meat, and my eyes began streaming tears. Briefly I considered just walking away, but then, before I knew what I was doing, I jammed the sword down so hard that it embedded in the dirt below. The sack split down the center with the high-pitched whine of a perforated balloon, and the organs spilled out in a multicolored tangle. The second the translucent skin touched the grass, it melted into a foul gel. The bowels traveled the farthest, expanding around my shoes. I minced away in disgust. A tiny wave of movement caught my eye, and I realized it was the escape of every ant, beetle, worm, and other insect that lived on that patch of soil. They wanted nothing to do with the sickness soaking into their world. I surveyed the mess. That brown pouch was a stomach, and that large green thing was probably a liver. But what on earth did a troll gallbladder look like? From inside the house, a single clash of metal. Tub and I looked at each other. His fear was broadcast by the sheer amount of his displayed braces. He began scrubbing frantically at the upside-down star with his wet shirt, turning both objects pink. I looked back at the spilled offal and tried to sift through the organs with cat number six. More noises from the general direction of the second-floor window, this time a thumping and scuffling. There was no time to be delicate about this autopsy. I dropped to my knees, and my jeans dampened in the coagulating mucus. I took a breath and plunged both hands into the warm viscera. The entrails didn't like my touching them. They spat acidic juices that burned my skin. Ribcage blades scissored down on the tips of my fingers. A net of blood vessels twined up my forearm and gripped with painful ferocity. Each organ cried out in a tiny, angry voice, and still I dug with furious fingers, kneading each slick piece of meat for a hidden surprise. I knew I had found the gallbladder as soon as I touched it. It was boiling hot. I pulled it from the muck with a loud slurp. The blood vessels around my hand snapped off, and the rest of the innards went limp and moaned in tones of pipsqueak loss. I raised the gallbladder in a victorious fist. It was the size of a golf ball and the texture of wet spinach. It roiled in my hand as if it were filled with maggots. I reached for Jack's burlap sack and tossed the little orange bastard inside. 
Nine more to go. From somewhere on the second floor came the sound of splintering wood. I flinched. Tub hit the deck as if under fire. A baby began crying from the upstairs window, and I expected to see the parents' bedroom lights turn on before I remembered that everyone else in the house had been schmoofed. Victory here was up to the troll hunters. With a battle cry more falsetto than intended, I exchanged cat number six for Claire Blade and cut through the next sack. In seconds I had the gallbladder. Seconds later it was in Jack's bag. I hacked and scattered and splattered and grabbed three gallbladders, four, five, six, seven, eight. Specks of guts sprayed against the house and I shouted for Tub to wipe those off too. From the second floor window came an agitated bat wing flapping, the loose flesh of the null hullers being disrupted from whatever they were doing to the baby. I sliced open the ninth sack with a swordsmanship that was darn near admirable. The gallbladder, as if surrendering, hopped right to the top of the gore, and I snatched it. Chaos erupted. The troll hunters had breached the nursery. Lights turned on and the battle began to rage. I heard the panting of Jack, the growling of Arg, the sanctimonious snorts of Blinky. The null hullers made no other sound than the laundry line snapping of their skin. After all, their throats had been left down with me on the lawn. Some instinct, the same one with which I had memorized Jack's fighting techniques, told me that we were losing. There was a lack of finality to Jack's sword strikes and too many surprised yips coming from Arg. The null holers grew louder as they flapped their skin in unison. But it was the absence of one noise that disturbed me most. The baby had stopped crying. I dropped the sack of gallbladders and hurtled toward the back door. Are you nuts? Tub shouted. I gave cat number six a backhand toss, and it impaled itself in the grass at Tub's feet. Use that if any come out, I yelled. What? Paint, Jim! I'm only authorized to scrub paint! Even at my speed, the darkened rooms of the house gave off a mausoleum chill. The humming refrigerator, the empty easy chairs, and the random pattern of the scattered remote controls all took on deadly significance. These would be artifacts of the dead if I didn't hurry. I found the stairs, took the steps by threes, and was at the nursery in seconds, bashing through the doorway with Claire Blade gripped in both hands. The walls were painted a sunny yellow with a motif of pink panda bears. This detail I noticed, despite the fact that I could see very little wall. Half of the room was matted black fur. Arg, looking larger for being confined to such limited space. It had not occurred to me that, in the human world, her size could be a disadvantage. But that was the case. The cramped quarters slowed her down as the null hullers nipped at her like angry dogs. Jack and Blinky were having better luck. I counted five dead null hullers lying tattered on the floor like ripped rugs. The others waged active war, claws xylophoning across Jack's pinwheeling swords. Even with his face concealed behind a mask, I recognized the thrilled expenditure of energy unique to thirteen-year-olds. For the briefest of moments, I saw a glimpse of the kid Jack could have been, if only he'd been gifted a life of snagging flyballs on the diamond instead of hacking at unspeakable hell spawn. With the flat side of his blade, Jack knocked a null huller across the floor. Instantly, one of Blinky's tentacles lashed out, squeezing the troll with enough force to tear right through the skin. Death was instant and bloodless. Six dead, four more to go. Even without throats, 
the remaining null haulers could speak in a breathless wheeze, and with the medallion still around my neck, I could understand them. These were not conversations. This was, instead, the ritualistic chant of a brainwashed cult, the same three chilling words repeated. Chant the baby! Chant the baby! Chant the baby! The crib had been pushed away from the window so that it acted as a barrier to shield the null huller duo hiding behind it. The crib itself was empty. These two trolls had the baby. I pressed myself flat against a wall and began skirting the room's perimeter, booting aside candy-colored toys. So far, I was going unnoticed. I reached the edge of the crib and leaned over to have a look. One of the null hullers had wrapped its empty skin completely around the baby. A pale nectar secreting from the troll's pores had covered the infant from head to foot. Before I could close my astonished mouth, the baby slid out of the ooze and landed supine and sleepy on the floor. But the nectar itself was stiffening, and I realized that the troll had essentially made a plaster cast of the baby. I leaned even farther over the revolting display and saw the baby-shaped space inside the hard nectar begin to weave with veins and nerves that started to grow organ clusters like hanging grapes. Already soft pink marrow was being fortified with white bone and covered with a pale elastic skin. They were forging their own fake baby to leave behind. The second of the null haulers reached out with its spindly arms, took the real baby by her feet, and began to lower her into its open mouth. There were no organs left inside, which meant the troll intended to use its empty torso as a bag in which to carry the baby home. I booted the crib aside and drove Claire Blade through the second troll's softies all the way out the other side. It uttered a death caw and dropped the baby. On instinct, I let Claire Blade clatter to the floor and dove to catch the child. She landed in my hands, smacking her lips through the daubs of secretion still covering her body. I held the baby to my chest, relieved not only to have saved her, but also thrilled to have killed a troll. Jack had been right. I did love it. The null huller that had made the plaster cast flattened itself against the wall. I swiped Claire Blade from the floor and swung it. The troll was too fast. It hopped, using the blade as a stair step, and bounded over the edge of the crib. The sword continued its movement and cut the changeling baby in half. It was the grisliest thing I'd ever seen. Feelers of skin tried in vain to cover the exposed innards. The chest cavity's organs, half human and half troll, clung to each other like blind kittens fresh from their amniotic sacs. Only the changeling baby's top jaw had been completed, and it gummed helplessly upon the air. The eyes, though, were pure troll. Blinkless black orbs glowering at me in condemnation. The half-formed human skull exposed the troll brain hiding beneath. A glossy green thing nippled with twitching nodules. I was crying when I killed it. It was an abomination. The job had to be done. But the changeling had already mastered a baby's voice and it sobbed as I hacked it into smaller and smaller pieces while holding the real baby in my other arm. By the end of it, my entire body was shaking so badly that Claire Blade fell from my grip. The crib was thrown aside. Jack was in my face. I saw my numb, blood-spattered reflection in his goggles. He sheathed his sword and wrenched out his horseshoe, bringing it to the baby's face. She's not, I said. Shut up, he said. He took a shuddering breath. 
I saw his fist tighten around his scimitar. Then he pressed the horseshoe against the infant's forehead. The baby scrunched up her face in annoyance. Jack sighed in relief and stuck the horseshoe back into his armor, then grabbed me by the front of the shirt. Where's the last one? he demanded. I blinked around the room and saw nine dead null holers, including the one I had lanced. Vaguely, I remembered the one who had dodged my sword and vaulted away. I think it went. I gazed at the open window. Jack cursed and bolted from the room. Arg! spat hot foam and bounded after him, angling her massive shoulders to fit through the door. Still, the tips of her horns drew squiggles through the sunny yellow paint. I felt a tugging in my arms and found two of Blinky's tentacles taking the baby. He did it with such gentle assurance that I did not object. Two other tentacles joined to shift the baby this way and that so that a fifth tentacle could daintily wipe the troll secretions from her body with a towel. The infant giggled and grabbed her feet with her chubby hands. I retrieved Claire Blade and began backing from the nursery, astounded by the sight of a dozen other tentacles at work, pushing the crib back into place, gathering the scattered toys into a semblance of order, writing fallen lamps, reinserting pictures that had popped from their frames, and who knew what else. I'd have thought we'd never been there, if not for the terrible feeling that I'd failed. Chapter 23 The backyard stunned me with its normalcy. Studded gardening gloves draped drowsily across a deck chair. A clear sky pinpointed with stars hummed with the faraway progress of red-eye airplanes. Two dogs down the block had a conversation from their respective yards. Even the grass at my feet had reclaimed its territory. The piles of innards had dissolved, leaving ten patches of moisture no more threatening than dew. The actors populating this easy-going stage looked as though they had wandered into the wrong play. Arg! stood at the far edge of the lawn, her giant horned head swinging back and forth as she searched for the escaped null holer. Streetlights glinted from Jack's twin scabbards as his upper body expanded and contracted with infuriated breaths. Even Tub looked out of place. A regular kid, sure, but with orange hair frizzed into a clown wig and a shirt slopped to his chest with pink paint. He gave me a helpless look. It happened so fast, he said. It's okay, I said. It was just one. You know nothing, Jack snarled. Uncle Jack, I thought the formal title might help. We killed nine of them. The bag of gallbladders? Did you forget that? We killed zero. A sinking feeling overtook me. I looked to Tub, who shrugged. It flew down here? gobbled its own guts and took the bag. What was I supposed to do? This is not your friend's responsibility, Jack snapped. He is not a troll hunter. It was just one, I pleaded. That just one will go to Gunmar. It will tell him about us, about you. Look, I'm sorry. I told you to stay out here. Why couldn't you listen? But I thought you guys needed... Jack ripped the mask from his face and whirled around. Who asked you to think? Don't think, listen! What, you believe it's just your precious little life at stake here? You're going to fail your math test? Screw up your stupid play? There could be another war. Dozens, hundreds... More than you'd believe could lose their lives. Trolls you might think are worth the dog crap on your shoe, but who just happen to be my friends. 
humans too, people you know. Does that make it worse? We have a week, Jim. One week. The ground shook. The three of us turned to see that Arg had fallen to her knees. Jack took off across the lawn. I followed but tripped on my own feet. Tub was there, though, to catch me by the bloody shoulder. Groaning in disgust, he placed cat number six in my hand so he could wipe the troll goo onto his jeans. We quickly came upon Jack, standing alongside his bowed friend. He had, for some reason, drawn both swords. Arg's posture was racked. Her mighty back hiccuped with pain, and her neck was so weak that her great horns weighed down her head. I took a step closer, hoping to comfort. Jack halted me with the tip of Dr. X. No closer. I'd made a few mistakes, but that hardly warranted an outright threat with a weapon. I was preparing to voice my grudge when I noticed a cardboard box discarded in the mown grass. Instantly I understood, and my aching shoulders slumped farther. I began circling at a safe distance, Tub fighting me for every step. The eye of malevolence was fastened to Arg's face. The writhing stems had twined their way into the troll's orifices, streaming down her throat in red plates, corkscrewing up both nostrils and sliding beneath each eyelid. Pulling ever tighter at Arg's brain, the eye had flattened into a gelatinous oval that bubbled like pancake batter. Arg's spine curled with agony beneath her lathered pelt. Get it off, I told Jack. It's killing her. Jack's muscles tensed, but he made no such move. I clashed cat number six against Claire Blade. Jack flinched just a little. I'll do it, I shouted. Move! The tree trunk legs pistoned, and Arg sprung to her feet, paws curled upward as if holding two planets head thrown back. Where I expected a howl came instead multi-octave laughter, cacophonous as a herd of trumpeting elephants. The curled horns struck a tree branch, and it exploded into a hail of wood chips. Jack kept his swords ready as the spray dinged off his metal armor. Arg swooped her head toward Tub and me. The eye of malevolence convulsed in delight, and the green-orange iris opened in a toothed yawn. Gorgeous. It was the soggy voice of one who'd spent decades gnawing on his tongue. Gunmar the Black, the Hungry One, saw me, smelled me, wished to eat me. From somewhere within the pupil's void, I could hear the splintering whack of what I knew was his wooden arm. He was aching to add another few slash marks of conquer, and as much as he'd prefer to do it in person, he wasn't strong enough yet, so he'd just use this handy four-ton puppet. One of Arg's clawed hands barreled at us, big as a school bus. The wind of it knocked us down before the paw itself arrived. Tub and I clung to each other in the grass, too scared to scream. The paw never reached us. Gunmar bawled through Arg's muzzle. Tub and I scrabbled away on all fours and saw Jack withdrawing his longsword from Arg's calf. Her hackles stiffened and she turned on my uncle, bearing skewed teeth. But when she saw the boy bravely wielding his little blade, her shoulders fell. Both paws made fists and landed on the ground, and from there she eased her body to a seated position atop the broken tree branch. Tub and I were jostled by the impact. The eye of malevolence fattened and wobbled like dough. 
dozens of veins retracted from Arg's skull, each one unchaining her from bondage. The eye quavered upon her muzzle for a few seconds before falling, bouncing once on the ground and rolling to a halt amid the manicured grass. Arg! dropped her weary face into her massive paws. Jack sheathed his swords, put his hands to his friend's neck, and whispered in her ear. The suburbs were quiet enough for me to hear. I'm sorry. I didn't cut deep. Just a scrape. Boy, humans. Me want in belly. A shame. Shh, Jack whispered. I wouldn't let that happen. Not mean it, Arg cried. Tell me what you saw. Jack pet the damp fur. Before you forget. No holler, go to Gunmar. Gunmar send more. Gum gums find fuel. Fuel for machine. Even in the dim light, I could see the paling of Jack's face. The machine? We destroyed the machine. I was there. I saw it. Gum gums work hard. Gum gums fix. Boy humans right. Killaheed makes strong. Much sad. Much sad is Ark. From my seat in the grass, I forced out a question. What's the machine? Jack's expression of dread unnerved me. He shrugged away my query. Nothing. Don't worry about it. What's important is that Arg confirmed everything, and none of it's good. Trolls like these tonight? That's nothing. Gunmar will keep sending them every night to occupy us while he waits for the Killaheed to be finished. It's a perfect plan, and we have to deal with it. If these gum gums are out gathering fuel for the machine... Jack cut himself off. He searched for solace in the lines of houses, the fences, the roads, all of the comforting right angles of the suburbs. But at last he drove both swords into the lawn with the red-faced frustration of a thirteen-year-old. Why does everything have to be so hard? The subsequent quiet would have been unbearable if Blinky hadn't chosen that moment to slither back to us. He used a single tentacle to lift Tub and I to standing positions as he passed. With curt movements, he plucked the Eye of Malevolence from the grass, gathered the cardboard box, and then put the former in the ladder so as to save us from its blinkless stare. He tucked the box into Arg's fur and began his jovial report. The nursery is as dandy as ever. Even dandier if you want the truth. I could not resist rearranging a few elements so that the room had a better flow. You wouldn't believe the wonders that can be achieved by a more cunning placement of a nightstand. I do believe I missed my calling. Blinky waited for adulations. Instead, he was met with a fatigued foursome rendered voiceless by a night of defeat. He sighed and looked to the east, where a line of orange razored the horizon. We've had worse days, he said softly. Come, come. Let's take these boys home. It was with some effort that Jack dislodged his swords from the dirt. Following this signal, Arg raised herself to her feet, favoring her left calf just a little. Blinky took the lead back toward the bridge, and the other warriors began shambling after. I lagged behind just enough so that I could grab Jack's arm. The web of notebook spirals swallowed my fingers. Jack looked at me with bloodshot eyes. Why? I asked. Why are you dragging me into this? 
Jack's reply was as hushed as branches blowing in the night breeze. It's a terrible thing, isn't it? To be dragged under. This ends Disc 5. Other people that love your presence, God. Here tonight are those that have said, we'd rather have Jesus than anything else.